What's going on, guys? We are back with Hostile Q&A number five, and I'm excited to be here to answer your questions. We got about 135 questions. I'm going to set the timer on my phone. You guys know how I do it. We'll set the timer for one hour, and I'm going to try and get through as many questions as I can in one hour. And then if we go over the hour, then maybe I will just do a part two uh, for you guys. But I'm definitely going to get an hour set. You guys can see that. One hour and start. So I'm not going to go over any nonsense. Company, just I'm going to say this really quick. It's I know it's your hour, but I'm going to say this really quick. The company is awesome. We got all of our legal stuff signed off on. Everything is finished. The label is being printed. All the different textures that are in the label. I'm so excited, man. You guys, I cannot wait till you see the label. Um, we put as much passion into the product from the formula to the label to the type of bottle we're using to the type of fulfillment center we're using to make sure you guys get good shipping. Um, we picked a fulfillment center that has other fulfillment centers on the opposite side of the world so we can just get things to all of our customers at good prices and good times. I'm not saying all those things are going to be rolled out right from the very start, but we have a a plan as how to roll things out so that we can get our supplements to everybody in the best way possible and the cheapest way possible. And, um, I'm, I'm just really, really excited guys. It's just, it, it's there's 20 years of bodybuilding passion in those bottles. And, um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say I have the best formula and I'm better than all the other companies and all stuff. All I'm going to tell you is this, I, uh, have learned, I've, I've made mistakes in 20 years. I've done some bad things. I've done some great things. I've kind of learned what I really love about bodybuilding and what things work in bodybuilding and what things don't. I, I've, I've realized what details matter and what details can be left out. And, uh, all of that passion I have for bodybuilding, you guys know how much I love the sport is in those bottles and, uh, is in the formula and is in the label and, um, it, it's it's really, I, I didn't think I would be this excited about it when we started, and, and I really, really am. Um, and I, I just hope you guys feel it when you try it. I hope you guys, when you try the supplements, you guys feel the difference and, and you realize that this is something that uh, I'm very, very passionate about. And we're, I'm sure we're going to make mistakes as we go. Um, this is all new to us, and we have a small team. We're all working very hard. Um, but we're definitely putting our best foot forward and I hope you guys can feel it when it comes out. Anyways, uh, I am, I, I think I took, um, okay. I took three minutes of your time, so I'll add three minutes on the end. So we get the full hour. Okay. <laughs> Thanks guys for bearing with me. Okay. First question is from Conan HQ says cardio post-workout whey or EAA shake. Um, in my opinion, this is what you should do. So we created an intra-workout product that has essential aminos in it and a little bit of carbs in it. Um, it's a small amount of carbs. So even if you're dieting, it will help you with your workout without kind of ruining your diet. So what, in my opinion, if you take the pre-workout and then you take the intra-workout during your workout, now you have the EAAs in your system and you've already kind of started the recovery process, you can do your cardio without having to drink another shake. Now, if you don't want to buy the intra-workout, we have an essential, uh, an essential amino acid that you can buy. And I would drink that during my cardio and then eat when I got home. That's what I would do. But definitely, um, the last option on that list is drinking a whey shake in between, um, your workout and your cardio. I would either do the intro workout shake during your training and then just do your cardio after, or I would do the essential amino, uh, shake just during my cardio. And, and then that way I, I'm kind of, starting the recovery process and kind of protecting my muscle while I'm doing that cardio. On to the next one. Rick Barry says, when will registration for your Windsor show be? Poster looks great for Toronto. Uh, reg registration for the Windsor show will be open soon. Uh, uh, just follow uh, Fuad Abiyad Champion at Fuad Abiyad Championships on Instagram and all the information will be posted there. Uh, the Walid Sikh says best protein snacks. Uh, I don't really snack on anything protein. I, I, I mean, I guess you could say almonds. There's some protein in almonds or um, I, I don't really consider protein a snack. 
if I'm going to eat, I'm going to eat a meal. I'm not going to eat a protein snack. So if I'm going to snack on something, I might have some fruit, like a tangerine, a couple tangerines, a grapefruit. Um, if I'm going to dirty snack, I might do some cookies or something, but I don't snack on protein. Um, protein is just part of my meal. That's just how I look at it. Dave Graham's 46 says back workout with an emphasis on upper back development, please. Uh, I can't write you a whole back workout right now. And the question, that's not really how this works, <laughs> but it's more of a Q and a for specific questions. But if you want an upper back, upper back movement, I still think T bars with a wide grip is probably the best upper back movement. Oki 23 says, when is the release of Haas Sups? Uh, we're looking at a production date of March 15th. Pre-orders are probably going to start the uh, second or third week of February. And then production will be March 15th. And we're hoping to have everything shipped out April 1st. So the pre-order period will last like a month, four to six weeks. You can order all your stuff. And then April 1st, we're going to get everything out the door. And... Um, we're not really sure how the company's going to take off. We're not sure if it's going to take off like a rocket or take off like a snail. Uh, I just, my worst fear is that we sell out. I mean, I guess it's a good problem to have, but it's not. So <laughs> we're, we're, um, we're excited to see what happens. The one and only jelly man says, what are some possible flavors of protein that you may or may not release in the future? We haven't started working on protein powders yet. Uh, we started kind of sampling some, um, but I think I'm going to change. Uh, direction a little bit. I'm really, re I, I like whey isolate, pure whey isolate, not, not a mix, not a blend, a pure whey isolate. I like that, but I'm really starting to read more up on hemp and pea protein blends. So mixing the two together gives you a really full array of essential amino acids. Um, and I feel like it'll digest better in the system, but there are a lot of studies and our, our company is very heavily based on studies. Um, we don't like to just kind of pick something because it feels good. We try and make sure there's a number of studies on each item that we choose. There's not a lot of studies on hemp and pea proteins right now. So I'm a little bit hesitant, but I've been trying them and I like the way they feel like the way they digest and things like that. So, uh, I'm not sure about flavors. We're still in the process of deciding which Avenue to take. We might just do both. That way it gives, uh, vegan people an option. Um, and it gives, uh, people that just want proven performance, also an option. So we're kind of looking at both. But, oh, if you want to know flavors, I guess we don't know what the flavors are going to be yet, but my favorites are just are pretty simple, really. I'm a huge fan of chocolate, chocolate peanut butter, cookies and cream. It'd probably be stuff like that. Um, I know over in Europe, they do a lot of fruity flavors. I've never been a fan of that for proteins. Uh, maybe strawberry. Um, strawberry vanilla. I like the, I like a lot of the basics, but we're, we're going to play with it. I'm sure we'll come up with some, uh, interesting flavors when the time is right. We're just got to decide on the basics first. Kyle Devine says, what would you say is the best meal before going to bed or does it not matter? A lot of it has to do with your plan and what type of plan you're on. Are you on a carb cycling plan? Are you on a high fat plan? Are you on a high, on a high carb plan? Are you bulking? Are you dieting? A lot of these things matter, so it's hard to say what's the best, what the best meal is. But personally, in a, in a general diet, I would say that your last meal of the day is probably going to be primarily based on protein and fats. I don't necessarily see, unless you're like, if you're working out, let's say after meal five and meal six is your last meal, then you're probably going to have carbs in that meal. But like for me, for example, I work out after like meal two or three. So I don't really need any carbs in meal six, I just don't feel like it's necessary. It's not because they're going to convert to fat. I just sleep better with a, when I'm not really, really full. So I just like to do like, a, if I say protein and fats, I would either say if I want something that's going to digest really easily and I'm dieting and I'm worried about, you know, stomach bloat and things like that, I might just go with a whey isolate and a tablespoon of peanut butter, blended, drink, go to sleep, and that's it. If I'm not bulking, but in between, I really want to maintain muscle and I don't have to lose fat really fast or anything like that. I'm probably going to do like a flank steak with a vegetable of some sort. Uh, I might have a piece of fruit with that. I know it's carbs, but I might have a piece of fruit with that. Just as a little bit easier digest digesting. Um, and if I'm pure bulking, I'm probably going to go with a steak 
and rice or steak and potato or even steak and oatmeal, not, not obviously mixed, but, um, so yeah, it really, really depends on what your goals are, but in a general setting, I would say, uh, protein and fats, you know, egg whites and avocado, steak and broccoli, whey isolate and peanut butter, things like that are kind of easy to, to put down before bed. You're not eating like a high voluminous meal. Voluminous? Is voluminous a meal? Is voluminous a, a, a word? I don't know. You guys will let me know in the comments section. Um, the one and only Jelly Man says, will any of the products have creatine monohydrate? Yes, our pre-workout has uh, creatine monohydrate, you know, a good amount, clinically dosed amount. And there are hundreds of studies on creatine monohydrate. And I wanted to make sure, you know, the funny thing is we tested a lot of different variations of our formula before we finalized it. And creatine was one of the last things to put in there. I, I put in there. I actually wasn't, I wasn't really set on it, but after the last round of trials with creatine added in, I noticed a significant difference. So we did add it in finally, and I'm glad we did. Um, I think everybody's going to notice the difference in that. Well, they're not going to notice the difference, but they'll notice that their pumps are really good. And I think creatine contributes to that pretty greatly. Um, Demetra Malakinian. When your calories get super low, do you consider intermittent fasting? Uh, no. Uh, I've always been of the belief, and I'm not saying it doesn't work, and I'm not saying it's not. This is just... The, all the opinions I'm giving are just my opinions. And I just want to say, I know we're already into everything, but I'm already, I'm just going to say, I'm not a guru. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. These are just things that work for me and things that I noticed over the course of 20 years. Now, I personally don't like not feeding my body. I don't feel like it's good for maintaining or building muscle. I feel like the body works best when it's fed a constant stream of calories, even if you're on low calories. So for example, one of my, one of my most stringent diets or, or hard diets that I went through for a prep, I think I was down about 2000 calories and I was way, I weighed in on stage at about 260 pounds. So I was pretty big and 2000 calories is not much for a guy that size. And it's still important, in my opinion, to get that steady stream of calories to maintain, especially when you're on that low calories, to maintain whatever muscle you do have. So I feel like if you're going to be on a, in a calorie deficit, you should really spread those calories out. And I know it's harder. It's, it's a lot harder than intermittent fasting, in my opinion, because once you wake up and you break that fast, now you're hungry. And it, it makes it harder to wait, having this super small meal and then waiting two hours or three hours, having another super small meal and then waiting, a, it makes time go really slow and you get really, really hungry. Whereas intermittent fasting, you just know, okay, well, I'm going to fast until four o'clock. I'm going to eat until 10 o'clock and my meals can be a little bit bigger and then I can go to bed. That may work on a, it may be easier for you to handle and it may work better for losing fat but my opinion is the best way to lose fat is to maintain muscle. The more muscle you can maintain, the easier it's going to be to lose fat. So although it, you may suffer more with six small meals over the course of an entire day or seven small meals over the course of an entire day, um, I believe it's going to be better for maintaining muscle because you're getting a constant stream of food and nutrients to the muscle throughout the day. Project Manson says, something I've always wondered with squats, should you aim to feel it through your quads, hands, glutes, and do you push through the foot itself or through the heel? Um, I think when, I, when I'm trying to aim on what muscle to feel, it's more the whole leg. I'm not, it's not like um, a hack squat, for example. Like when I'm on a hack squat or a leg press, I can position my feet in such a way that I can either really, really target the hamstring and the glute on a hack squat if I put my feet really high on the pad, or if I put my foot really low on the pad, as long as I'm staying on my heels, I can target the quad. Same thing on a leg press. I can put my feet really high on the pad or really low on the pad, depending on where I want to target. If you guys want more information on that, check out the YouTube, my YouTube channel, uh, fuadabiad, youtube.com slash uh, I just did a leg video there and kind of explained some of this stuff. but. Um, in a squat, it's a little different 
I'm just trying to perfect my technique. I'm going to let my body do the work and I'm trying to feel all the muscle groups. See, this is the thing about squats. Squats don't just build your quads and that's why they're the superior exercise in my opinion because they build the entire leg. So if you want those thick, those thick tree trunk legs, you should squat. Now, if you can't squat because you have a back injury or a knee injury or whatever, it doesn't matter. You can still grow your legs in other ways. But if you can squat, you know, if you take the time to learn how to squat and do the proper technique, you can develop your entire leg. And that's the, the quad, the sartorius, the adductor, the, the glute, the, the, the hamstring. Everything will get thicker and more dense. And you'll end up with a much better looking leg if you can learn and squat properly. But as far as feeling one area or another, I mean, I guess you could if you, if you squat really narrow, as long as you try and keep your heels down, you're probably going to feel more sweep. Um, if you squat really wide, you're going to feel more adductor and, and uh, more teardrop. But uh, the second part of your question is where do you want to push from? And the last thing I would do is push from your toe. You can push through the heel, but I, I kind of try and aim from the halfway point of the foot back. So it's not really your heel. It's more of like the center of the foot and your heel. I definitely, the one thing I definitely never do unless I'm doing sissy squats or something specifically to target, I never go up on my toes. If I'm on the leg press, if I'm on the hack squat, if I'm, on, if I'm squatting, if I'm front squatting, whatever compound pressing movement you think, I feel like the best possible thing you can do is push from the center to the heel of the foot. And if you are going to get up on your toes, it should be very light and it should be for a specific purpose. Not, you, you shouldn't definitely shouldn't be squatting five plates up on your toes or leg pressing 12 or 14 plates up on your toes. You're only asking for knee problems. So that's kind of the answer there. But like I said, check out that leg video. I'll kind of go through all this a little bit. It's only a five or six minute video. I'll give you a little bit more insight as to what I'm talking about. Yari513 says, I talked to you previously, took your advice, got an MRI. It turns out I got a chronic tricep calcific tendonitis. No good therapist around me. Any suggestions? Um, the best way to get rid of calcification in your tendons is shock therapy. In my opinion, that's probably the, the, the first thing you should look for. So uh, it's shock wave therapy is what it's called. You should find a chiropractor. A chiropractor may have it. Find a physiotherapist in your area that has a shock wave machine. Those that shock wave can um, target the calcification in such a way to possibly break it up if it hasn't solidified too much. I have calcification in my elbows. Um, the shock wave therapy will not do anything. It's definitely hardened too much. I'm at the point where if I want to get the calcification of my tendons removed, I have to probably have surgery, which I'm not willing to do. Um, there is another way to do it where they needle the calcification and break it up and then they suck it out. You're going to have to talk to a doctor about that, but uh, I would try and do the shockwave therapy as a first line of defense and kind of work through it that way and then see if that doesn't work, then go to the next option. Poetry by Moses says, what kind of mobility recovery work do you do? Example, foam roll, etc." cetera. Um, to be honest, not enough. Um, I should do more prevention. Uh, the most I do right now is probably use my um, my massage gun. Uh, I use my massage gun quite a bit, usually post-workout. I'll come home, like if I train quads, I'll come home from a workout and I'll, do, I'll use a massage gun on my legs, kind of help break everything up and loosen it up. Um, I found that it reduces the amount of time I'm sore for. So instead of being sore for three to four days, I'm sore for one or two days and I'm ready to get back to work after that. So uh, the massage gun has been a, a major help for me. Uh, before that, I think foam rolling, but I definitely didn't do it enough. I know a lot of guys are doing yoga now on their days off from the gym and stuff like that. I think that's a good idea too. Um, but yeah, the massage gun is probably my best, uh, my best friend right now. Uh, Daniel Seven says, can you bulk up and lose some fat? Uh, it's a tough question. You can, you can gain muscle and lose fat, but it's a very long process. So if you can walk that line of where you're in a deficit and a surplus and kind of cycle your calories, 
so that, you know, you might be in a deficit one day, you might be in a surplus the next, and you're kind of carb cycling, doing that kind of thing. You could possibly put on some muscle and lose fat in the process. This It's definitely a, one way to do it. But I feel like, honestly, if you want to put on a good amount of muscle and really see a difference, you should do a lean. If you don't want to get fat, it's fine. You don't have to get fat. Just do a lean bulk. And uh, nobody, nobody ever, ever said, you know, you, you should get fat. You know, when we say bulking, it's not an excuse to get fat. Stay lean, be in a good surplus of calories, put on weight, and then cut back when you're ready. But give yourself a good three, four, five, six months of, of clean eating, clean bulking, so you can actually put on some muscle. Because nothing happens in four weeks. One of the biggest problems I see is guys will bulk for four to six weeks. And they're like, okay, I'm ready to diet now. Well, you haven't done anything. The most muscle you're going to put on in a month is two pounds. And I'm talking muscle tissue. I'm not talking about water weight or filling the cells with water, or filling the cells with glycogen. I'm talking about muscle tissue that's going to stay there. Like, you know, no matter what, that muscle tissue is going to stay there. That, you know, two pounds a month is like what really what you're looking at. And you need to give yourself one, two, three, minimum three, six is better. Three is, you know, the more time, the better to put on some really good muscle and then start burning the fat. If you're trying to do it at the same time, you know, I know guys who have been middleweights for five years, you know, because they just are trying to always stay lean and they, they never seem to get over that hump. You, you never seem to break that plateau of being a middleweight because they're not really taking the time to feed their bodies the nutrients. It really, our bodies get in a, in a state where they're comfortable at a certain weight, right? And what bodybuilding is, is really unnatural in a, in a sense of, we're trying to make our bodies do something it doesn't wanna do. What we're doing is causing trauma when we're lifting weights. So we're lifting weights, we're causing trauma, the body's going crazy, oh my God, I have to adapt to this new thing I'm doing. I'm going to be, gain more muscle so that I can adapt to this, this trauma I'm going through every day. So if you're just kind of easily, you know, going through your diet and it's really easy and you're putting down a, a small amount of calories, there's nothing that's going to push you past that plateau. You got to put in the food into a, almost into an amount that's uncomfortable so your body can break past that weight. You know, a lot of guys will message me like, I can't break 200 pounds. I can't break 210 pounds. I can't break 220 pounds. I'm just, I've been stuck here for a year. You're not eating enough. You need to put the food down. And it means for a long period of time. So your body can adjust to this new level of calories and grow into it. So I kind of got off topic here, off track with your question, because you want to know if you can bulk up and lose weight at the same time. I just think, I guess what I'm trying to get at is it's possible, but I think it's a really bad way to do it. There's a reason bodybuilders bulk and shred because we're trying to maximize the amount of muscle we're putting on and then shredding when we put it on. It's really hard to do the two together. It's possible, but it's, I haven't seen it done very successfully by a lot of guys. Um, The Iron Ape says, not a question, but can you have a power lifter on explaining the difference between wraps and knee sleeves? Um, or how much salt is too much salt? Uh, I can't answer the salt question. I think that the number is like 3,000 milligrams a day is the, is the most or the average. I can't remember, so I don't want to say. I haven't, I haven't looked into it, so I, I can't tell you for sure. But the difference between wraps and knee sleeves is very simple, in my opinion. Uh, I don't think we need a power lifter to explain that to us. Wraps, okay, we'll start with, start, first we'll start with knee sleeves. Knee sleeves give a little bit of compression, but they're not really helping you lift. They're not helping with the weight. They're not helping with the spring out of the hole. They're not, they're just really a small amount of compression. They're keeping the joint warm and that's really all I use them for. And that's really all they do. They don't really help you lift at all. They're kind of just a small bit of compression just to keep you feeling safe. It's almost more mental than it is actually physical, but it, it's just a safer feeling, to be honest. 
Wraps, on the other hand, if you wrap, this is why I say this, I say this all the time, and I, I'm not sure if anybody out there has heard me say it, but if you wrap your knee wraps properly, like the wraps that go around, you, you don't want, you should be uncomfortable. You don't want to leave them on. Like when I put my knee wraps on, they're cutting off the circulation, like hard. And the reason you, the reason they have a stretch, like when you buy knee wraps, the stretchier they are, the worse they are. You want them to stretch, but you want to, you want to have to like really pull to stretch them. Because when you put them on your knees, you're supposed to stretch and wrap, stretch and wrap, stretch and wrap until the whole thing is wrapped. And then it, it starts to pull back on itself and it really compresses the, the joint. What that does is actually help you lift. Now, how much it helps you lift, I don't know, but that's why there's different powerlifting competitions like raw competitions where they're not allowed to use knee wraps. And there's ones where they are allowed to use knee wraps because they do help. Now, whether it's a lot of mental or whether it actually takes weight off or whether it helps with the spring, I feel like it actually helps you with the spring. Um, there's definitely a small aid in how much weight it is. I can't say. If somebody's squatting seven plates, it's still fucking uber impressive that they're squatting seven plates, even if they're wearing knee wraps. Um, I've, I put knee wraps on for four plates. For me, it's more of a protection because I just feel like my knees are a little bit older. And I've taken a lot of wear and tear, so I try and do it for safety reasons. But a lot of guys for powerlifting will do it because it will help them. Like, it can make, if you put them on really tight, it can make, you know, five plates feel like four. Or it can make seven plates feel like six. Like, maybe not to that degree, but you get what I'm saying? Like, there's actually a difference. Whereas knee sleeves don't do that. Knee sleeves can go on. You can keep them on the whole workout. They're not cutting off your circulation. They're just a small compression keep the joint warm, keep it stable. And that's about it. The knee wraps are a lifting aid. Okay. M thrill 79 says, what's the perfect shoe for leg day? Uh, I don't think there's a perfect shoe. I think you should be my personal opinion. Listen, I seen, I saw Steve Kuklo squatting five plates on Instagram, like a couple weeks ago, wearing like just running shoes with like a squishy sole and shit. To me, that's absolutely insane, but he does it and he's strong as hell and it hasn't bothered him yet. But to me, I would never do it because I'd feel like I was on jelly. Uh, to me, the best thing for lifting, you know, for legs or for like deadlifts or anything like that, where you need to be planted is a hard sole. Okay. So you're either going to use a boot um, or you're going to use, like I wear chucks all the time because they have a flat sole or like Atomics or rider wear, or some people even squat barefoot or like just in socks. I don't like the socks thing because if you're on a wood platform, your socks can slip. Um, so I, I would go barefoot if I was going to do that. But um, personally, I think, I think chucks are the best. They're, they're the most comfortable, but excuse me, everybody has um, their own preference. Like I know Branch Warren uses, uses, uses work boots. So it's just, I think personally, Whatever your choice is, it's fine, but I think it's best to be in a flat sole, hard sole where you're really planted on the ground. Uh, Peter Jelinek says, how many espresso coffee cups do you recommend daily? Uh, I don't, I try not to do too much caffeine. I actually don't really drink coffee unless I'm like, re I have a really busy day or I'm on a, a long road trip. Um, this is the reason anything over 375 milligrams of caffeine starts to constrict your cells. So now you're hurting your pump. So I guess if you're training like later in the day, it's fine. Drink whatever you want to drink in the morning, but I try not to, because I don't want, I don't want too much caffeine to affect my pump. So I'm always conscious of that. I, I just, I don't, plus a lot of caffeine is, I just feel like it's not healthy to be drinking too much. Um, I think one coffee a day is okay. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure how much caffeine is in an Americano. I'm sure somebody in the comments section will let me know. But I think one coffee a day, one Americano a day, one espresso a day, I think is fine. I think if you're drinking four or five cups a day, you're probably a little bit resistant to the caffeine and you may need to take a break. Tom Williams, 1205 says, can you announce any flavors of the new SUPS? Can't wait to try them. I'm sure you'll be a huge success. Thank you, Tom. Um, I will tell you the pre-workout. We have, 
I'm not sure if I'm allowed to, t- to say. I wonder if my partners are going to be upset. Okay, I'll tell you this. I love watermelon. So we have a watermelon pre-workout and a watermelon intra-workout. Now, what we did with the intra-workouts, my personal opinion is if you're during a workout, I don't want to drink anything really sweet. I want something a little more refreshing. So the intra-workouts are a little bit lighter in flavor and the pre-workouts are a little bit uh, sweeter and tangier in flavor. So they have a little bit more punch to them. Um, I drink my pre-workouts kind of fast. I don't just sip on them. So I like that really sweet uh, bite to the flavor. Um, the intra workouts are, like I said, it's during my workout. So I want it to be more refreshing, more water-like, less sweet, less punchy. I don't want, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to feel like I'm drinking something really, really, really sweet while I'm training. Right. Um, the essential amino also is a little bit more milder in flavor because, you know, people like to drink their aminos during their cardio. Last thing I want to be doing is drinking something sweet, nectary flavor, like while I'm doing 45 minutes of cardio, or some people like to actually, some people mix them with alcohol. Some people just drink them during the day when they're sitting around. Um, so I, I wanted to create something that you could sip on and enjoy instead of like it being really sweet. Um, so the flavors are kind of set up that way. The only sweet, sweet flavors are the pre-workout and the pump product and the intra-workout and the essential are a little bit more mild. That's kind of what we have, but I don't think I could disclose too much. Like I said, the watermelon, I love watermelon. So for sure we have that. Um, but we have some other interesting flavors I think you'll like. Um, Matt Bright 10 says, what's the worst job you hate to do at home? I don't know. I, uh, what do I hate to do at home? I hate to pick up dog shit. Yep. That's gotta be it. I can't stand it. We have a dog. Our, our old man is 16 years old, uh, which is like ancient for a, a large breed dog. Uh, it's a chocolate lab and I hate picking up dog shit. <laughs> so that's it. I do everything else. I cook, I do the dishes. Uh, my wife helps me with my laundry, but I don't mind doing it. Uh, I took out the garbage. Um, and I work from home. So I like my podcast. I like, you know, I pack all the orders for the clothing and stuff. And, uh, I, there's nothing, I just, I don't want to pick up dog shit. That's about it. So, uh, big Westy 82 says, is your clothing range, is your clothing range available in the UK yet? If it is, can you let us know who and where we can get it from? Well, we ship clothing worldwide right now. Uh, I'll ship it right from here worldwide to everybody who anybody who wants it the problem is shipping is pretty expensive from here to the uk it's literally like 50 dollars. so you're almost paying more for the shipping than you are for the shirt depending on what shirt you order so i apologize for that uh with the with the supplement company launching we're hoping i'm not sure what the fulfillment center prices are going to be like but we're hoping um see this is the thing the fulfillment center is in the u.s but they also have a sister company or an additional facility in the UK. And they also have additional facilities in other, other parts of the world. When we roll out the company fully, uh, which will take some time, we're hoping that all of the facilities will hold our stuff. So shipping to the UK, ship, it'll, it'll ship right from the UK to the UK. It'll be, it'll be in your backyard. Uh, shipping in Australia, shipping, it'll all be, set up around the world to where we want it to be. So nobody will be paying like a maximum amount for shipping. That's one of the issues we run into right now. Now what they charge for shipping to the UK, I'm not sure. But like I said, if I try and print a label right now for shipping to the UK, it's going to be at least 45 to $50. So you're free to order. If some people, a lot of people do, I have, I have done a lot of worldwide orders, um, but I'm just kind of giving you a heads up ahead of time. Jared Ketter says, waist trainers, are they worth doing in prep? If so, are there brands you recommend? Um, I really like Skinny Roadie, okay? It's go to Instagram. Well, you're on Instagram because you're asking me here. So um, at Skinny Roadie is at S-K-I-N-N-Y-R-O-T-I. And DM her, tell her I sent you. And 
she's got the best waist trainers because she makes short ones and she makes long ones and she makes ones that have Velcro and she makes ones that have clips. My favorite are the ones with the clips. Um, and I like the short ones because they kind of go underneath your lats. So your lats, if you have the, if you have the longer one, it kind of wraps around your lats and it doesn't, it's kind of compressing your lats, not compressing your stomach. If you get the shorter one, it'll compress the lower area of your stomach, which is what you want. And I do feel like they're beneficial and I don't feel, I don't feel like they're beneficial because of the traditional reason why they were used. You're not, we're not crushing. I mean, I don't use one so tight that it's crushing my abdomen. Okay. I use a two XL and I use an XL when I'm trying to like pull things in a little bit more, but to crush my abdomen, I'd have to use a medium. So the point I'm trying to make is this, when I wear an XL, it basically makes me conscious of my breathing, conscious of my posture and conscious of pulling my stomach in, which when you pull your stomach in, when, when I just do it right now, those are your TV. That's your TVA, your transverse abdominus muscles. That's the muscles around your torso that are helping keep everything tight. When you don't wear a waist trainer, you're eating all the time. Those ten, those muscles tend to loosen up and they're not getting worked properly. That's why you get some distended bellies and wider waists. When you put the waist trainer on, it kind of forces you to think about holding it because the waist trainer is so tight. So when you take the trainer off, like you're supposed to wear it for like four or five hours a day. When you take the waist trainer off, you're still kind of holding those muscles. So you feel like you have a better, uh, better control of your stomach and a better look. So I do think they're very beneficial, but not for the traditional reason of crushing your abdomen and crushing your waist into this tiny little thing. It's more just a stomach control, muscle control type of thing that it helps you with that over a long period of time will make your waist smaller. Hulkster42 says, currently off-season bulking and really struggling with my last meal of the day. Any good suggestions? Um, well, I'm not your coach. I'm not sure who your coach is, but if your second last meal of the day is too big, that might be the problem. You might have to shrink it. But if you're bulking, you might have to suck it up. I'm sorry to tell you guys this, but there is no answer to bulking and making it feel good if you're trying to break plateaus. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what coach tells you they have the secret recipe and you never have to be uncomfortable and being uncomfortable is bullshit. I'm sorry. Anybody I know who's put on a significant amount of muscle, who's done a proper bulk. And when I say bulk, I'm not talking about dirty bulk necessarily. I'm just talking about a bulk, meaning a, sur a very high surplus of calories. Meaning you could be doing three or 400 grams of rice per meal, which is it's a lot of rice and it's going to be very filling. Now, anybody I know who's done that, trust me, they all go through a period where they're like, I don't want to eat. I can't eat. I don't want to bulk. I can't get the meals down. I get, I've been through it, man. My wife has heard me complain about being bloated and uncomfortable so much. She's probably doesn't even pay attention anymore. It's probably just, it's probably just background noise. I don't complain that much anymore because I don't bulk like I used to, but from age 20 to 30 or even 20 to 35, I was bulking hard every year and every off season. It would be like, I would be like, Oh, my stomach. Oh, I'm in so much pain. Oh, I can't sleep. Oh, I don't want to eat right now, but I have to. It, she probably doesn't even hear it anymore. It's probably just white noise, but that's, I'm sorry to tell you, man, at the highest level, we all go through it. You know, Antoine, Antoine just put up a post recently. I don't know, last month or two, he was eating like three or 400 grams of rice per meal. And he said he's having trouble getting the food down. Of course he is. It's a lot of food. It's a lot of food. And it's not appetizing. It's not like you're eating chicken and rice. You're like, oh, this is so fucking delicious. It's not delicious. It's not horrible. You can make it in a way and add condiments to make it taste pretty good, but it's not eating pizza. So it's going to be hard, man. It's all, you know, I can't give you a solution. Some solutions are pay attention to your fat levels. Your fat levels may be too high, but if you're bulking, you want the fats, in my opinion. Pay, pay attention to your salt levels. Your salt levels, may, salt is very satiating. If you're adding too much salt, it could be hurting your appetite. Um, one of the other things is, you know, coffee, cigarette smoking. Not sure, just putting it out there in case uh, any of you smoke. Smoking is, a, is an appetite suppressant. 
coffee is an appetite suppressant. If you're not doing any cardio, you know, doing 20 or 30 minutes in the morning might help spark your appetite a little bit more. All these things can help and keeping your food really clean. If you're adding like little bits of junk in here and there, it can kind of mess with your appetite a little bit and it won't make, it'll make things a lot harder to get down. But at the end of the day, even if you're eating a perfectly clean diet, even if you're doing cardio every morning, if you're bulking, it's going to be uncomfortable. Okay. That's all there is to it. Even in the best case scenario, you know, look, if I give you Antoine's scenario, for example, uh, bulking really hard with the food, cardio in the morning, um, all clean food, not cheating. Still hard, still hard for him to get it in. Me, same thing. You know, for 15 years, I would do a cheat here and there, but a lot of my food was just bodybuilding food, but it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard to get the meals down. And you just got to do it. It's all there is to it. You have to do it. Make those small adjustments, I said, in case you are. You know, maybe you're cheating too much. Maybe your fats are a little bit too high. Those things all matter. But I'm assuming your diet is all clean. It's not going to be easy. Archer85 says, what are your thoughts on the GDA supplements and the way they are being marketed? Um, glucose disposal agents. I don't know too much about them. I don't think... From what I do know about them, I don't think they're as, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sold, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I'm not sold on them. It's not something we have planned to release in our, in our, in our lineup. Uh, I'm not sold on what it does. I don't think, um, I mean, processing your carbs in a better way is a good idea always. And if you can make it happen, then it's great. And I th I'm sure the supplements may help, but I have yet to feel the difference myself. So it's not something I'm really sold on. Jay-Z Bodybuilding says, what actually got you into training at the very beginning and who was your first bodybuilder, famous or not, that you saw and was taken back by? Best wishes from Joe. Um, a friend of mine got me into training and he was actually the one that I saw and I was like, holy shit, that's what I want to, that's what I want to look like. This is the thing. We used to work at a bar. I used to bounce and believe it or not, I used to have like a men's physique body when I, when I very, very first started, even like when I very first started working out when I was 19, I used to be fat when I was like 15, well, 16, 17. And then I wanted to get lean. So I got really lean and I had like a nice beach body. And then I started working at a bar and we were bouncing. And one of the, the head bouncer at the bar was bodybuilding and he weighed 250, 260. Uh, he was an amateur and he would just walk through the bar and people would just move out of his way. And I know it's really a meathead thing to think, but I was like, wow, look at that. Just people just get the fuck out of it. And he looked, it looked cool. I thought it looked cool. I thought having a massive back and big shoulders and big massive arms. I'm like, I kind of like that. And I kind of had started working out. I was just kind of messing around with the iron a little bit. And I'm like, maybe I could do that. But I didn't really care. I was like, it's cool, but I'm not going to go that far. It's, kind of gross not really my thing but we we all became friends and we all went to see his show he was competing and that same bouncer we went up to watch one of his shows and it was a pro-am in toronto and i actually got to see marcus rule and dexter jackson dexter jackson was actually my favorite bodybuilder because it was the first bodybuilder i ever saw i got to meet mike Matarazzo at that show it was really really pretty amazing but when mike my friend at, at the club that was a head bouncer went on stage I was like, wow, you know, that's really something different. Like, I'm really impressed by that. And then I start talking shit <laughs> like any 19-year-old like any kid would. But I could do that if I wanted to. And um, a friend of mine looks at me and he's like, okay, do it then. He just said, dare. And uh, I said, what? He's, a, he's like, do it. He's just talking shit. Why don't you do it then? I said, okay. So we set a date for a year later. It was probably more than a year, about 14 or 15 months later, I did my first regional show and I won the overall. And so I kept going and I won my second show. And then I'm like, I think I want to keep doing this. And then I took third at my third show, which I was very unhappy about, but I went on to nationals and I took fifth out of 20 guys in my, at the national show. And then I kind of knew I was hooked. I was like, you know what? I'm still new. I'm 22 years old. I just took fifth out of 20 men. 
you know, these guys were a lot older than I, than I was. And I said, you know what, I think this is something I want to do. And, um, I knew I didn't have the best genetics for it, but I knew I, I loved it. And that's kind of where that's all it took. That's all it took. It was a dare. It was all built on a dare. And that's when here I am today. So it's weird how things work out, man. Um, Kitty Cranberry says, how do you dump toxic people? I've been competing this June and have had people say you looked better before, etc. After that, how do you find people who align with your goals? Still nervous to talk to people in the gym. Well, talking to people in the gym is hard. Uh, I don't think anybody, you can just go up to talk to anybody in the gym because people are working on their own goals in the gym. And a lot of times people don't want to be bothered. Um, if you're a woman and you're talking to guys, guys get kind of creepy. Um, I think it's probably easier for women to talk to other women in the gym, but I'm just assuming that I'm a guy. I don't know. Um, I don't, I, I'm not sure how to meet people. I'm not the best at that myself. I kind of just nod and maybe talk to people during cardio here and there. And then you kind of can, be, can become friends. Or if I go to a local show, you kind of meet people at a local show. You're like, Oh, you know, is this your first show? And you kind of start to become friends with people at the shows because you all have a, a common bond. The one thing I can say for sure is you definitely have to get rid of the toxic people in your life because bodybuilding is hard enough. Okay. If you want to compete, if you want to be in bodybuilding, fitness, figure, physique, classic, whatever, whatever category you decide to enter, it's really hard enough. It really, really is. The, the entire society is going against us. Um, not, not like, you know, oh, the world's against us kind of way, but I mean like there's a lot of fast food places. Most of your friends in society want to go out and drink on the weekends and have fun. And there's, you want to go on vacations. And if you try and meet a boyfriend or a girlfriend, they usually don't have the same interests you have because most people are not into bodybuilding competing. And this is really an, an extreme thing. So as far as meeting the right people, I'm not sure. But the one thing that I am definitely sure of is if you're going to be successful, you either have to do it on your own, like not on your own, but you have to be free of, of um, negative influences from the outside. Um, or you have to have a really good support system. Like if your friends are jerks, but you have a really supportive boyfriend, then you'll be fine. You have somebody to kind of counterbalance the toxicity, right? But if you're single and you're, all your friends are not into what you're into and you're doing this thing by yourself, it's kind of a matter of time until, because all it takes is a bad day, right? Like we all have bad days. Like every day is going well, you're happy, you're training, everything's good. And then one day you're like, man, you know, today's really tough. I don't really feel like doing this. I don't feel like going to the gym. I kind of get, I think I'm going to order a pizza. I don't, I'm just not feeling it today. And then you call that toxic person. You're like, hey, what are you doing today, man? You want to come over and have a drink, order a pizza? We want to go out, go to the bar, whatever. And that person's like, yeah, for sure, I'm in. But if you have the other kind of people in your life, you can look at them and say, hey, I, you know, I'm not really feeling it today. And they're going to call you and they're going to go, don't be a pussy. Get your shit together. Get to the gym. Do your fucking workout. Go home. Make your fucking meals. And man the fuck up. Because this isn't for babies. So... I don't know how you can meet people that are in the industry. The best thing is to do is to hang out in places with industry people, like a gym, go to a gym where people compete. It's not just like a family gym or uh, go see some of the local shows and try and meet people there um, that are more like-minded like you. But definitely the other flip side of that is get rid of the people that aren't supportive. People think it's stupid. Oh, it's stupid. Why are you packing your chicken? Oh, you you're so boring. You don't go out on the weekends anymore. Oh, you don't want to drink anymore. You don't want to party with us. You're what's wrong. What are you wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Those people are not, those people are fucking going nowhere. Okay. I don't want to say they're going nowhere, but they're not going in your direction. So in my opinion, you don't have to find people that work out, but you have to find people that are fucking after it. Okay. They don't have to be people that train, but they have to be people that respect and have a drive for life. Right. They respect you and your choices and they have a drive for life and they have a, yeah, you know what? You, don't go out and drink. It's okay. 
We'll go out next time. We'll go out when you're done your show. We'll go out when you're done competing. We'll go out whenever you feel like it. Right now, stay home and eat your fucking chicken and do your shit. I got your back. Well, I'll come over. We'll watch Netflix together or some shit. That's the kind of person you need in your life. Um, and if you don't have that person, then you should get rid of the shitheads that you do have in your life and, and try and find those people. But this sport is too hard. Um, this sport is too hard as it is. Or this lifestyle, if you, want to call, you don't want to call it a sport. This lifestyle is hard enough as it is. Without the proper influences in your life, you're only making it exponentially harder. Um, Gronimo style said, lifestyle says, what's up boss? My question is about understanding mind muscle connection more. I recently had a total shoulder replacement about six months ago and now started to work out again. I'm not able to push really heavy weight to grow. If you're talking about the mind muscle connection with the shoulder you had surgery on, it's going to take a long time. I'm sorry to tell you, all you have to do is this, just focus on that arm. So instead of doing a lot of double arm stuff, do single arm stuff. So for example, like if I'm going to do tricep press downs, instead I do one arm press downs. Okay. And I might use 50 pounds with this arm and I might use 15 pounds with this arm, but I have to strengthen this tricep and also do very slow negatives. Very slow negatives will help you reconnect with that muscle and help the muscle get stronger faster. But you have to give it its own time. So don't just be like, well, I did 50 with this arm. I'm going to do 50 with this arm, even if I can't feel it. No. Do 50 with this arm and then do 25 with this arm and go really slow and really make sure you can feel what you're doing. Because just think of it this way. If you tore something, a nerve pathway was severed. I know this is really simplistic. And if there's any doctors out there, they're probably going to think I'm crazy. But just for hypothetical reasons, okay? If a nerve pathway was severed or interrupted, you have to recreate that connection, right, to that muscle. So make sure you focus on it and give it the time it needs by itself. Don't just keep doing double arm stuff. If you're bench pressing, use dumbbells. If you're shoulder pressing, use dumbbells or use the unilateral hammer, hammer strength uh, machines. Do you have to give it time and give it, give it its own focus? I love to fly high says, will there be creatine HCL or creatine monohydrate in your pre? Uh, as I said, at the beginning of this uh, Q and a, our product is heavily based on clinical doses and studies that we were able to find. And we don't want to just put it out for one study here, or one study there. We wanted products that were very heavily tested uh, or I tested myself and could really feel a difference in, in this kind of thing. So um, creatine HCL, for example, has been shown to be more soluble, but there's not a lot of studies that prove actual strength or endurance gains. And um, creatine monohydrate has like hundreds and hundreds of studies behind it. So we decided to go with the one that has been proven to have more effect on strength. I, I know the HCL shows a little bit better solubility, but I can't find strength studies on it. So the creatine is in there to help you with strength. So I wanted the one that was backed by hundreds of studies. So I didn't have to worry about whether it was going to be, it was going to be working or not. And that's kind of how we picked a lot of the ingredients, if not all the ingredients that we chose because if it's not backed by studies, then I, I don't really want to use it. So that's kind of why we made that choice. Um, Dragon M UFC says top five important things to consider before stepping on stage for the first time. Wow. It's been a long time. Let me think. Um, you have a good, well, this is probably an iffy one, but I'm going to say it anyway. You have a good coach. I never believed in doing anything like trial and error. It's stupid. I feel like every sport in the world has coaches. They have, you know, if you go to football, they have quarterback coaches and running back coaches and line coaches and bodybuilding seems to be the only sport where you're looked, looked upon poorly. If you have a coach, I never agreed with that. I think having a coach is good. Having a good, reputable, credible coach is a good start. Um, having a discipline to follow your diet, not missing any workouts, 
not missing any cardio sessions and posing every day for the last six weeks. That's five right there. It's pretty simple. I mean, what else can I say, right? Don't miss workouts. Don't miss cardio. Don't cheat on your diet. Have a good coach to set that all up for you. And do all your posing. Oh, there's going to be six. I believe it's really important to make sure you're prepared properly for the stage. And when I say prepared, I mean the look, right? Make sure you pay for a tanning. Like you guys are have it really good right now. Way back in the day, we used to have to paint ourselves. There was no tanning people that came and just sprayed you. It was none of that shit. I used to have to get a roller and a bottle of pro tan and roll it and then roll it on myself. And you'd have to get somebody to do your ass and, it usually was your best friend and you all of a sudden became really, really good friends. Not in that way, but you just, you know, you had your best friend like rolling your ass cheeks and it's just, it was a nightmare. Now you don't have to do that. Now you pay a hundred bucks, 150 bucks, whatever it is. You go into a little booth, they spray you and you come out and you look great. So don't be cheap. You've gone for 12 or 16 weeks, you know, suffering your ass off, pay the hundred bucks and have somebody spray you properly so that, you don't lose because your tan sucked. Okay. So that's six, seven, seven is make sure you have a good tanning base. I know a lot of people don't like tanning beds, skin cancer issues, blah, blah, blah. But I always felt like my color was way better if I tanned in a tanning bed leading up to the show. And then they put a tan on me, like the, the paint on me because my base was so much darker already that it just all looked really, really good. So there's seven tips there. So there's probably more. Get a good pair of trunks. Don't buy any garbage. Get something that's cut properly for your body. Um, don't pick music that you like. Pick music that's good for your routine. So one of the biggest mistakes I made for posing was I picked music I liked. One of the shows I specifically remember was the Dallas Europa in 2008. I posed to What You Want by Beastie Boys. Now, I love the Beastie Boys, but it's a horrible song to pose to. <laughs> I just embarrassed the fuck out of myself. I learned as I went that there was my style of posing was suited to dramatic music, like dramatic theme music and orchestras and shit like that. Um, so that's what I started using and it really, really went over well with the crowd. So remember, don't necessarily pick music you love. Pick music that is flows with your body and with your posing style. Anyway, there's more than five there. Uh, Erica seven says, do you hang on to the handles when you're using the stair mill? I rest my hands on the step mill, but I do not lean on the step mill. I watched a lady run today. I, I shouldn't say these things, but I, I people watch when I'm on the step mill, right? Cause you're kind of above everybody. I swear to God, this woman today was on the treadmill holding on to the top of it and running. She ran like this holding on and ran for half an hour. And I'm like, just let go, just let go. Just slow the machine down a little bit and let go. You're not gonna fly off the back. You don't have to set it at six miles per hour if you have to hold on, set it at five miles per hour and let go. Let your body do the running. It, it just, it blows my mind. Now, will I lean over once or twice in the course of 40 minutes? Yes, but I'm always conscious to not do it for more than you know, 10 or 15 seconds. I try and always stay upright and make my body do the work. Um, Trey Green says, what are some extra exercises that you do that you feel are underrated, not used as much as that should be used or a lot more? Um, I don't really do anything underrated, man. My, my, see, one of the things I believe about training is people are really, you know, trying to reinvent all these new exercises. You know, one machine I really, really like that bodybuilders don't use is the, the universal shoulder press. So the universal machine, like with the pin loaded stack, the shoulder press, almost all of them just destroy my shoulders better than the hamstring machine or sorry, the hammer strength machine or dumbbells or a barbell. For some reason, the plate, the pin loaded shoulder press, um, almost like any brand, just 
devastates my shoulders. So that would be one. Very underrated for bodybuilders. Most guys don't use it. Um, but I, I just, it's always in my workout. Um, for anyone, Carl Ritchie says, for anyone not thinking of ever stepping on stage, but looking into getting stronger and putting on mass, are basic exercises best? Yes. Uh, for anybody thinking of stepping on stage, basic exercises are best. When I say basic, I don't mean just squat, deadlift, and bench. I mean basic like, you know, the stuff that's not reinventing the wheel. You know, all your benches, incline, decline, flat bench, flies, those are basic. That's your chest workout. Um, you know, shoulder press, lateral raises, rear, like reverse pec deck, front raises with dumbbells. That's your shoulder workout. Like it goes on and on, back workout, your pull down, your T-bar, your barbell row, um, maybe your pullovers, that's a back workout. Like you could do those exercises over and over again. That's an hour, guys. But you could do those exercises over and over again for years. And as long as you're trying to increase the weight or increase the reps or trying to overload some way or adding intensity techniques like drop sets or, or rest pause sets, you're going to keep growing. There, there is this myth out there that if I do barbell rows, T-bar rows, pull downs and pullovers every week for five years, my body's going to stop growing after one year and it's going to figure it all out. No, that only happens if you don't add anything to those exercises. So I could take those four exercises and I could add a whole bunch to them. You know, when you start barbell rowing, you might start with one plate. As you get stronger, you're going to go plate and a quarter. You're going to go two plates, two and a quarter, three plates, three and a quarter, four plates. Every time you add a quarter, you're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And the stronger you get, the bigger you're going to get as long as your diet, assuming your diet's proper. So there's the weight aspect. Now, let's say you're at four plates and you can't do any more. Okay, you can't do four plates for 10 every week and keep growing, but you can do four plates for 11, for 12, for 13, 15, 17. Maybe now you do four plates in a 10, four plates in a, in, in a, in a 10 and a five. Like maybe now you've maxed out your weight, you max out your reps. Okay, now maybe you do a drop set. You do four plates, then you drop, you do three plates, you drop, you do two plates. The point is, I'm trying to make is I can take those four exercises and keep growing forever as long as I'm trying to overload them in some way. So I forgot, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> oh, basic exercises. The point I'm trying to make is the basics are the best. The basics work. All the stuff you see on Instagram, all the fluffy exercises, they're cool they do add like a twist and they, some of them do hit muscle in a different way than you could. And I'm not like shitting on any of those things. I do them sometimes, but I do them after all the basics. So like if I post like this really weird exercise on Instagram, it's usually after I've already done barbell rows, T-bar rows, wide grip pull downs, close grip pull downs. And then I just said, Hey, let me try this freaky thing I thought of for back and I'll post that. But that's not my go-to. That's like additional just to burn out the muscle or do something like a little bit. The basics work. The basics work the best. Bodybuilding has been around for a hundred years and or more. And these things have been worked through already. And we already know what exercises work. And yes, like I said, there are variations of a lot of different things, but more so for interest than anything. In my opinion, like if you look at Dorian Yates, Dorian Yates did the same workout for like 15 years and he just kept getting better and better and better and better because he kept overloading the exercise, finding new ways to load it. So he's proof that that's how it works. But we're in an age where people want to be interested, right? It's not necessarily just about the work and it is for me too. So I'm not saying I'm excluded from that list. I want to keep things interesting. So I like having a, a really deep arsenal of exercises to choose from. Some kind of fluffy stuff, some everything, but the basics are always staples in my workouts. The fluffy stuff or the variations usually come after I've done my squats and my leg press and my hack squats. And now I might do some Bulgarian splits or some sissy squats on the Smith machine or some weird thing that isn't really that normal. 
but it's after the squats, the leg press, the hack squats, the stiff leg deadlifts, after all that's done. So the basics are the basics for a reason. Those are going to help you be the best. So don't put too much emphasis, like Luke would say, focus on the broad strokes and not on the little knife cuts. The little knife cuts come later on. Focus on the broad strokes and, and really build your physique into something special. Okay, guys, that's going to conclude Hostile Q&A number five. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for participating. There are a lot of questions I didn't get to. I may try and get back to them and get to a part two, but if not, what we might do is just post another Q&A post. And if your question wasn't answered, please ask it again. Uh, I do my best to get to as many of the questions as possible. If I didn't get to yours today, I apologize. But I do want to answer them. So if we post a Q&A, just submit it. And who knows, maybe I'll try and get to it. And if not, I apologize. We're doing our best. But thank you guys very much for watching. Make sure you follow the page. Make sure you stay tuned for details. Because um, we're, gonna, we're almost going to get ready to start going. So. Things are going to blow up fast, and hopefully you guys will be on us, on, with us for the ride. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to the channel, like, and share with your friends, and um, we'll see you guys on the next one.